Hi everyone, this is part of an ongoing series in which I overanalyze Beyond Good and Evil. If you have not seen the previous videos, I recommend, nay demand, you click the link in the corner to be taken to the playlist. So without further ado, enjoy. Perfect! Perfect! <laughs> Notice Fen sitting right by Jade's side as she wakes up. While I think it's fair to assume that Jade cares for all orphans equally, Fen seems to have grown the most attached to her, probably because of all the meditating and possible martial arts training. But we get to that when we get to that. This cutscene reiterates two main problems and one solution. What a pessimist! You faithful servant, Secundo, has found the answer to your money problem. Secundo, we're stuck here. No hovercraft, no shield. Optima has cut off the power. The account is empty. Units, you want units? You come to Secundo, mia bella. Listen to this. The director, Senora from the Science Center, wants a collection of all the animals on the planet. She pay you dinero for any photo you send with little animal on it. Mira, that beast, for example. You take picture of it and tenga mucho units. Even your perro interests them. Not another one of your hair brain plans, Segundo. Gonna have to... We already know the power is out and the hovercraft needs fixing, but at least one of those can be solved with Jade's real weapon of choice, her camera, which completely breaks when running the game in 4K. If I had to guess, the game probably counts how many of the pixels on screen or of the animal you're trying to take a picture of. In theory, they would make it so you have to make sure to not be too close nor too far away. But in 4K there's just always way too many pixels of everything, so the game will always assume you're too close. 1080p works a lot better. I also love the report that's on in the background. I mean, who edited that? <laughs> Me? Miss, a word for our listeners. Uh now that we've finally entered normal gameplay, Make sure to turn the subtitles on again and adjust the camera settings. The defaults are no good for controllers. The first person aiming with the camera, however, is unfixably finicky, so you're just going to have to get used to that. From this point forward, the video will be less focused, I suppose. I'll just be pointing things out as I see them. Heading upstairs, we can see more of the orphan's living conditions. I especially love that little drawing of Paige. It goes back to what I was saying earlier. He's either a cuddly pig or a tough as tusk spore, depending on whether he likes you or not. We also get a look at some of the photos Jade has taken in the past. They're all cute, innocent fun. It's a nice way of showing her pre-crisis personality without forcing us to sit through 40 minutes of goat herding. Calm down, kid. Your parents might not be dead. Jeez, cry baby. And since this is a video game, it is now time to loot our own house for food. Nice. Starcos are among the select few consumable items. They're... They're this. don't know. I do like that this guy survived and Rayman didn't. Like, come on. Although there's evidence Rayman might be real in this universe, so who knows. I never noticed this little drawbridge before this playthrough. I always wondered where that big hole from the meteorite went, but the thing I just ran across solves that mystery. After taking some pictures of animals and people and everything in between, we can finally pay our electricity bill. Here we learn that the Optima service does in fact stink. Good to know. We can now turn the shields back on and are informed that there's a mission for us. The game has kept it a secret so far, but Jade is actually a freelance journalist. That too will be important. Here we see Paige in his natural habitat, fixing things while mumbling angrily. This is where we learn that Paige can repair just about anything if he's just annoyed enough. We receive our first slash second M disc, which we will be using to learn about missions and general world building and other things. We mosey over to the M disc reader and save our game because goodness, I've written eight pages and we haven't even started a game yet. 
After taking a quick break to adjust some settings that'll hopefully fix things, maybe, we load our save game and... We load our save game and... Mompei SED, you guys are the worst. Now that we're back to playing in pre-war resolution, we can start cataloging for real. This isn't just a great way to make a quick buck, but also constitutes the main optional collectible. I'll backtrack up the lighthouse to snap some shots. Here, we can embark on an epic quest to retrieve some kebabs from Woof. Can't play now, okay? Oh, no, Woof, no! It's a very short and missable sequence, but it was with Kebups, the other healing item, which restores all your health. And some backstory in the form of showing Wolf's playful, mischievous nature that also hints at Jade not being very strict with him. She probably views him more as a friend than a pet. Stopping to look at the sky for a few moments, you'll see that there are several named constellations and planets visible. These don't have any impact on gameplay or the story, but it's a nice way to flesh out the universe. Taking a picture of some fireflies that appeared while we were looking at the sky longingly Bravo, fills up a first roll film and gives us access to the zoom function. I love that digitization film. of items that gives characters access to hammer space. Also conveniently explains how solid objects can be sent via email. Having remembered what we were supposed to be doing, we head back to the workshop to scan the MDISC. This war is a catastrophe for us all. Mr. de Castellac would like to entrust a very delicate mission to you. If you accept, please make your way as soon as possible to the ancient mine on Black Isle located on the other side of town. Having completely understood the enormous risks involved, Mr. de Castellac plans to reward you generously. See you soon. You know this de Castellac guy? Huh? Uh, can't go there, Jane. Smells like a trap. Dangerous. Peter's response to hearing the name Mr. de Castellac is immediately suspicious. He's shown to jump out of a window without a second thought, and the fact that he brought Jade's big staff along showed that he has full confidence in her capabilities. And gee, I wonder if he's hiding something. Are you loco? We need some dinero to protect us from those kinking dance. Video games are becoming more and more realistic in terms of visuals and sound but it can never fully convey a sensation of smell, so the game is forced to tell instead of show that doms are in fact smelly. Don't you worry, Paige. Everything will be fine. If you want, I'll go alone. No, no. It's just... Okay, we'll go together. But I'm sticking to you like bees on honey, whether you like it or not. Scundo, check over this computer and download a complete version of your OS. You'll be able to take a look at it, Jay. As for me, I'll try to get that stupid hovercraft up and running. Out here, otherwise this whole place is falling apart. <laughs> I love this game. Okay, it's working. We are once again connected with El Mundo Exterior. <sighs> I hate that show. But it's content. I love this. The devs didn't want to re-render the video, so they left the French section alpha in. It's just a tiny detail, but a little peek behind the curtain is always fun. That was some pretty standard recruitment propaganda. We hear General Keck calling out the traitors of the Iris network, which is just the alpha sections calling the kettle black. Not a lot of clever subtext going on here, which may be the point. Looting our own house is my favorite early game activity in any game. 
but there's a very limited them. number of times these boosts are actually useful but we'll talk about those way later pushing the generator into place is the game's way of teaching us that jade will not always be strong slash heavy enough to move large objects on their own this is important knowledge for later in the game the electricity arcing from spool to spool also serves as a mini tutorial for some puzzles later on The smoke and some dialogue from Paige lets us know that this hovercraft does indeed need fixing. Does that count as the rule of threes, rule of fours? Garage. The hovercraft is the perfect vehicle for a game with a terrible camera. Its big floaty tire balloon thing makes colliding with walls more funny than frustrating. Oh Here we get a this very limited taste of the exploration good. aspect. The graphics hold up surprisingly well, though the pretty reflections in the water are the result of the widescreen mod I'm using. Oh yeah, it's a European game. We get out to Malago Garage with Paige being ever the grumpy pig. It's at this point I should mention that this game is a pain to record on PC. During some moments, audio is horribly distorted in the recordings. Gotta get out of this tuna can, Jade. <coughs> so don't be too surprised if I ever just layer music over things. At the garage, we have a chance to talk to the rhinos running the place, starting with Isam. Isam asks about the orphans, specifically about the new one. This shows that Isam is not only aware of the orphanage, but also up to date on the kids there, which heavily implies that he's three doms in a trench coat. <laughs> in a trench coat. I forgot I wrote that line. Oh. It's no surprise that the rhinos know their neighbors, but the fact that they care about their well-being makes them immediately likable. The meteorite we saw hitting the garage earlier is also used as the explanation for why a shop would only carry one of each item. Another nice touch to justify an old trope. We go over to the Speedcraft motor and buy it for the low, low price of one Divalite Pearl. These K-Bops vending machines are going to be very important later on, I promise. For now, they just make annoying noises. They sell a limited number of items, all of which are neatly displayed for you to see before you decide if you want to buy anything. Since K-Bops only cost twice as much as Starcos, but refill all your health, there's no reason to ever buy Starcos. Same goes for the hovercraft repair pod units and their full repair counterparts. Some vending machines will have permanent health upgrades for you or your hovercraft, so make sure you check them all. Here we'll buy a Mecha Impulsor because spending money on consumable items is a full sport. We have a quick chat with Babukar who asks Jade about how Jade Reporting is doing, another polite rhino, and then goes on to say that while the damage done to the garage upsets him, he's glad that his mother and brothers weren't hurt, because that's the most important. <sighs> These rhinos are so sweet. We leave the garage and are immediately greeted by another Dom's attack. I, I love these little drones that show up to put out fires and ships. These are not scripted. The boats only catch on fire if they're actually damaged. Another detail that I never noticed until watching the footage while writing this. This creature serves as another type of mini-boss. Chasing after the massive serpent thing is fast and frantic, and staring it down while shooting it right in the face as it charges at you only to dodge out of the way in the last second is satisfying. I think the excessive spamming of mines might be a little overwhelming for new players, but luckily you don't lose a lot of progress if you die here. Destroying the Dom Sea Serpent nets you another Divalite Pearl, most powerful Doms have a pearl at their core, so now we know the massive difference in strength between a Garden Variety Doms and a Super Pearl Mutant. Now we're really ready to explore, or at least find our own way through the region. The first person compass is a very effective way of finding your way around. I used the word way so many times in that sentence, wow. Just point yourself in the direction of the marker and you'll probably get to your destination without too much trouble. Paige reminds us that we should be taking pictures of animals. A stool of blue scorpion fish. Bet you that an interest of science, Sanford. Which after all this excitement is something that you may have forgotten. 
I especially like the way this is handled. Other games would plaster a mass of textbooks titled Reminder over the screen interrupting the flow. <laughs> but here the dev specifically chose an animal that might come as a surprise. A school of fish suddenly surfacing that logically would get a hey look at this out of anyone seeing it. This is also the first instance of an animal that's somewhat challenging to get a good photo of. While this is partially thanks to the intuitively designed, natural, predictable movement of the fish, it is made needlessly difficult by the awfully sensitive camera controls on PC. We then get another reminder to go to Black Isle in Mr. case we forgot about Mr. that too. Wishes to meet you on Black Isle as soon as possible. Come on, a there are little credit. As we enter the city, Jade and Paige have a short exchange to organically tell us which way to go. It's not a big deal. There is literally only one other way out of the city. The pedestrian zone is on one side, the hovercraft race is on the other. So if Jade knew to reach Black Isle through the city, she would have also known to just head straight because that is, you know, the only way through the city. This obviously never bothered me before making this video, but I guess that's what overanalyzing does to her brain. We're shown here that the Dawn's attacks have even made it through the shields in the city. Things are getting serious. I just want to take another moment to appreciate these reflections. They're very, very pretty. Good job, modding community. On our way to Black Isle, we get our first bit of spam. Calling for witnesses. The traitors from the Iris Network have landed somewhere on Hillis. Large reward for any information. Again, these traitors from the Iris Network are causing all kinds of trouble. I like that Jade receives this mail at a moment in which she needs money more than ever. If it wasn't for Paige telling the Elphas to shove it, she might have actually taken them up on the offer and ended up on the wrong side of the conflict. It's pretty clever. We arrive at the Black Isle and get our mission. Notice that Paige does not talk during this cutscene. Hello, Miss Jade. My employer, Mr. de Castellac, like all the inhabitants of Hillis, wish to see an end to this war. The Alpha sections claim to be pushing back the Doms, but they're hiding the truth from us. The Doms monsters have already invaded every corner of our planet. Two specimens have been spotted at the bottom of this mine shaft. If we don't warn the population, their numbers will increase radically. Mr. de Castellac is prepared to pay a very high price to be able to defuse a picture of a pair of these monsters. This is a very risky mission, and you're free to refuse. Well, Dons aren't exactly our best friends. Tell your boss he'll have his picture. Jade accepts the mission, not because she distrusts the Alpha sections, but because she does know the Doms are the enemy. She bases her decision solely on facts, which is a very fitting character trait for a journalist. Welcome to the end of the video. If you have enjoyed the series so far, make sure to like and subscribe. It makes me feel better. I want to use these end of video segments to talk about things that you wonderful people point out. This is going to have spoilers for the end of the game in it, so if you don't want to see that, well, you've been warned. Three, two, one, spoilers. Declan, the certified handman on the VGE Discord, has pointed out that the hands on the creature in this vision are significantly less skeletal than they appear during the final moments of the game. Now this could mean one of three things. One, the design of the creature changed and the devs used an old model for rendering the scene. Two, a low poly model was used for some reason. Three, and that's the interesting one, we can clearly see the hole in its torso. I personally think that this hole was created when Shawnee was taken from it. This would mean that at whatever point in time we see here, the creature would already be dying at this point. It's possible that this is a flashback to a time after the creature lost Shawnee, but before its life force had faded to the point of its skin rotting away, or a Dom's like infection had spread through his body. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below or on the Beyond Good and Evil Discord. 
Whatever the case may be, I can say with absolute certainty that the creature's pronounced arms and long sleeves make it highly proficient at dabbing.